everybody. Happy to be back. It's my um, section, second um, mini lecture here. And really what we're going to do is, is focus on thinking about, um, you've heard a lot about the properties of stem cells. And what I want to do now is think about how to harness these unique properties for use in muscle disease. Specifically, what, are, what has been done? Um, what are the new directions in using stem cells in regenerative medicine for patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy? So what I think that you'll find um, throughout this uh, next few slides is that we, we're really getting closer to thinking about stem cell biology for these patients. And, and the question is, which of these stem cells is the best stem cell? Um, maybe it's a combination of thinking about different stem cells. Um, but sort of as a field, this is, this is really um, where we're at. So I'm going to tell you about how we test these different stem cells to try and understand um, which stem cells are going to have the most impact, which stem cells are going to really be able to, to benefit patients um, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So a lot of that has um, been, a lot of time in the field has really been spent thinking about what are the right models to test stem cells. And, and this can include things like, um, uh, you know, what is the, do we need to use larger animal models? Do we need to use humanized models? Um, wh how, do, what, how do we really know that our stem cell is effective before we take it to patients in clinical trials? So those are some topics that, that we're going to think about today. Now you've seen this slide. Um, you're, you're all um, Duchenne muscular biology experts. You, you know a lot about dystrophin, but let me put it to you in the context of stem cell biology. So Dystrophin is the largest gene in the genome. It, it plays an, an extremely important role in the muscle membrane. It acts as a shock absorber, um, really linking the actin cytoskeleton to the DGC, stabilizing the muscle membrane um, to the extra laminin cross-linking in, in the ECM extracellular matrix. But what happens in the context of stem cell biology is when dystrophin's missing, um, really, the whole muscle membrane um, becomes fragile. Um, there's a lot of changes, becomes leaky, and this um, activates or cues the muscle that I need to replace this cell because eventually this um, muscle cell with a leaky membrane is going to die. That cell has to get replaced, right? There's a balance, a need to, to regenerate new muscle. And, and so that really requires stem cells to activate to give rise to new muscle. So this is, this is how stem cells do that, right? So really what happens is that these, upon injury, upon constant damage, as would be the case in DMD where dystrophin is, is um, non-functional, um, this new um, muscle has to be made through activation of these satellite cells. And so it's, it's really the, the transition of making a new muscle cell goes through a series of, of phases from starting from a quiescent stem cell um, to um, a cell that can actually divide and then eventually fuse, migrate, um, and fuse to give rise to new muscle. And so this is, this is well understood in that there's a time course of regeneration that occurs um, after injury. And so Essentially, the stem cells um, begin to um, divide um, asymmetrically, right, to give rise, um, leave their quiescent state to give rise to a more differentiated progenitor cell, the myoblast. These myoblast cells really m come to the site of injury, align, make new muscle to eventually form a new functional, um, a fully um, multinucleated um, muscle cell and eventual myofiber. And you can see the timing of when this occurs over days and essentially that there's a remodeling of the muscle that occurs that essentially gives rise to new muscle as, as um, you can see in the um, panel to the right where you eventually get centrally nucleated cells which is a real hallmark of regeneration um, after injury. So. What, what's, what about the, uh, the context of what's happening in, in mouse models of DMD? Well, the, really the gold standard um, in the field so far has been the MDX mouse. And so this is the mouse model um, of DMD, which is due to a point mutation, exon 23, which generates a premature stop codon. And this is the model um, of DMD. And so um, a number of different labs working on DMD have spent a lot of time 
uh, thinking about this mouse model and really what's the progressive nature of this disease um, in the first few weeks over the lifetime of this animal. And so it's a, there's a well-characterized um, series of changes that occur to the muscle where there's a series of um, you know, cell death necrosis that then activates regeneration. And then over time, because this is a continuous battle of regenerating new muscle, eventually leads to um, cell death and necrosis. And, and so this over um, you know, 78 to 80 weeks has been well characterized. Um, and so one of the things that is different in this model, the MDX versus um, normal injury that occurs, is that in DMD, there is persistent um, inflammation, right? So um, as you can see, in the dystrophic muscle, uh, there's an immune component that is really activated um, at the same time that is talking to the stem cells that are telling these cells to continuously um, remodel and generate new muscle. But because this is sort of uh, persistent, um, what happens is that there's a change in the niche, right? So there's a change in the, the amount um, of ECM, the collagen, and eventually extensive fibrosis. And, and, and this is going to be a really different environment um, that the stem cell is going to see um, than the normal um, environment that you see in the top panel, which is really um, acute injury where um, injury occurs, um, a stem cells get activated, make new muscle, and this is repaired and regenerated um, over time. This is a, a chronic phase that's occurring in DMD, right? And eventually the stem cells um, will become exhausted. And what's also happening is that the muscle niche is changing, right, in this chronic environment. So this is important because when we think about stem cell-based um, therapies, we have to think about what's happening to the stem cell in vivo, but what else is happening in the niche, right? These are two things that, that are important when you think about um, different models of DMD as well as um, important factors that might change your preclinical studies as well as what's going to happen in the patient if we think about you know, cell replacement therapies using stem cells. So um, the traditional model, as I told you, is the MDX model. Um, a new model that really um, Helen Blau has pioneered is, is generating the MDX mice but adding an additional change, which essentially is um, generating mice that also have um, lack the RNA component of telomerase. These mice are called MDX MTR mice. These mice actually are a much more severe model um, of the disease. And so what happens is over time, um, these mice, it se seems that these mice have um, chronic injury, um, which again, as I told you, leads to more activation of stem cells. And these cells, um, you know, differentiate to give rise to more muscle, progenitors than myoblasts than few cells. But oh, this, is, this is a greatly reduced number of the ability of these stem cells um, to activate and give rise to new muscle. Um, this is because they have shortened telomeres, because they're lacking this RNA component of telomerase. And so this changes the biology of how that stem cell behaves it actually um, lacking um, both dystrophin and um, the RNA component of telomerase leads to a much more severe model of the disease, which is shown here. And so, so this more severe model um, of DMD, you can see from the actual data um, from this paper, which I encourage you to, to spend more time reading and thinking about because it's an interesting model, which essentially is that you know, lacking both of these components, um, they have a really uh, more severe d disease progression, um, as you can see compared to wild type um, or heterozygous uh, mice, the, uh, the MDX, um, MTR, what are called G2 mice, so gen second generation mites are much more severely affected. Um, they have a reduced body weight, reduced lifespan, and severe atrophy, as you can see in um, the muscle, in particular in the diaphragm muscle. And so this is a much more severe model um, of the disease, which is, um, you know, kind of, you know, improving our ability to think about the disease as well as to think about the role of stem cells in DMD. Now, what about in, in human um, actual DMD patient muscle? What's happening? 
Well, it's interesting in that there's also um, a progression that's occurring in, in human DMD muscle, which you can see here, essentially just looking at the difference between a four-year-old DMD biopsy um, to a six-year-old DMD biopsy, you can see that there's this chronic injury, uh, persistent inflammation, changes in the ECM, constant damage, um, and muscle is, is, is still um, regenerating by activating the endogenous stem cells, which are generating um, new muscle fibers. But you can also see that, you know, there's a lot of variation um, from patient to patient, right? And so there's um, extensive um, damage and replacement inflammation and replacement um, remodeling of the ECM and fib fibrosis that's occurring. Um, and it's sort of a stepwise progression in patients, but there also could be really differences in um, this remodeling process depending on the patient, depending on how the stem cells are behaving, depending on the, the specific mutation. And so these are things that um, we're still trying to understand, uh, particularly with understanding the biology of how this um, human muscle is changing. Uh, and so that we can compare this to our models, um, our existing models, to, to better understand the disease, as well as to think about um, and how the stem cells behaving and potential cell replacement therapies for this disease. So what about um, harnessing the potential of stem cells for DMD? Well, this is really exciting. Um, there are so many different avenues um, of, of um, ways that we can think about using stem cells for DMD. We can, we can think about um, studying how these different stem cells uh, behave in the context of these specific um, DMD patient mutations. We can also think about um, you know, harnessing the, the uh, stem cells for giving them back to patients, right? And so there's a longstanding history in the field of thinking about different stem cells. So either these stem cells can be used to, to replace the missing stem cell, the, the endogenous satellite cell, or um, to provide supportive factors that might help remodel the niche, right? To allow the stem cell to get in to do, carry out its function. Um, there's a lot of different sources of stem cells that are kind of being discussed with regard to um, uses for DMD, uh, things like um, uh, supportive mesenchymal cells, pericyte cells, mesangioblast cells. So what I'm gonna do in the next few slides is walk you through these different sources and kind of where are we with regard to the current status of using these cells for DMD. Before I do that, let's step back for one second and think about um, some of the, the needs that we have, um, progress, where we are, and challenges. Because I, I want you to understand that um, it's not as simple as giving stem cells back to patients, right? We, if we could do that immediately, we would. But there is a lot of important biology that needs to occur first. So which stem cell? Um, what's the source of the stem cell? Uh, do we get them from reprogramming fibroblasts back to a pluripotent state? And then what cell type do we generate from there? Um, once we have that cell type, say we're interested in the satellite cell um, because we think this is the best cell to target for um, re replenishing muscle in DMD. How do we get that pure population? Another important point is not only how do we get that cell, but how do we maintain that cell in the state that it needs to be in, right? Um, so that, those are things like in an expansive self-renewing state. Um, and these are things that we think about. So, so these are things that we have to, as stem cell biologists, think about in the context of, of using these cells in regenerative medicine. So challenges include purification. What happens when you purify stem cells? Are they the same? Are the properties the same? Maybe not, right? You have to functionally test that. Um, you know, if, you, if the cells are out of their normal environment, you take them out of a muscle, out of a um, muscle biopsy, you purify them, you characterize them, are they still the same stem cell? Do they require a different um, environment? Should we, should we give them a supportive stromal layer? Should we give them extracellular matrix, cytokines, things that we need to keep their stemness-like state? These are all important questions, and I think it's gonna, you know, depending on the stem cell population, it's gonna dictate which of these cells are, are gonna be useful clinically. Now, another important phase is, as I already told you, is once you have your stem cell of interest, 
how do you know that that stem cell can function like you want it to function in, in the context of um, uh, animal models that will benefit patients with DMD? Well, you have to first, again, purify, characterize, functionally test these cells, and then think about giving them back and testing them functionally in animal models of the disease. So I'll walk you through some different animal models. And then finally, you can think about thinking about giving these back to patients in preclinical and clinical um, trials. So, so there's a number of different um, challenges with regard to using stem cells um, in, in regenerative medicine in the context of DMD. And one of them is thinking about uh, which is the right model to, to test my stem cell. And so, as I told you, there's the gold standard model, which is the um, MDX mouse model. There's a more severe um, MDX mouse model. And now, um, a lot of labs are thinking about testing the stem cell properties in higher, um, in higher level models or dog models um, of DMD. So shown here is, is one example of a golden retriever um, with DMD at six months. You can see that the, the limbs are, are um, altered, that they're shifted. And, and why would you want to think about different models? Well, it's thought that maybe you need a model that is, is, is really a more closely aligned um, to, to the human um, severity to test the real properties of your stem cells. Now that's an important um, avenue, really, you know, more human model so that you can really test the properties of stem cells. However, um, these, these are um, really difficult studies to perform. Um, it's really low numbers of animals that are available and they're really expensive to maintain. So there's pros and cons of using the different models. Um, Another challenge is that um, because muscle uh, is, you know, encompassing the entire body, um, how do you think about delivering stem cells to all sites? Well, in the context of, um, of uh, DMD currently, for depending on the stem cell population, one of the things that's done is actually directly inject these uh, muscle stem cells into specific regions of muscle. And here you can see just direct injection or injection sites um, in dog models, and you can see newly regenerating fascicles um, or muscle being formed. So there's proof of principle that we can use these models to test different stem cell um, populations, but you know it's still sort of an um, open question as to which is the best model, um, which is the best dog model. Um, there's a series of different models, which if you wanna learn more about, you can read about the original publications um, testing these models, and then you know, um, you can think about how to, to really um, test these different stem cell populations um, in these models. So one of the things that has really been exciting in the field is the potential of using um, endogenous stem cells to, to really regenerate and replace um, the, the muscle satellite cells. So, so there's been a lot of preclinical studies thinking about um, how to engraft these cells into the dog models, and then even in human preclinical studies. And shown here is actual preclinical studies um, putting in these um, initially satellite cells which have made a progenitor or a myoblast cell um, in, in different models. So here is shown actually changes in um, strength, either with or without immune suppression, with or without um, cyclosporin. And what you can see is that with these different myoblast studies, um, over time, you can see some differences um, in the, in the um, ability of these cells to change strength depending on the muscle um, region. But really, there's, there's really minimal significant changes in strength after myoblast transplantation. So why is this? Well, it goes back to understanding the biology of the stem cell, right? So the stem cell is a cell in the endogenous muscle that can continuously self-renew to give rise to new muscle. Well, once these cells have differentiated, they've reached a myoblast state, they're at a different state, right? So it's thought that maybe you need to be thinking about, um, you know, getting an earlier or the, the actual satellite cell um, for transplantation studies. The challenge is that we're still learning about this satellite cell. Um, to be able to harness it, to be able to expand it uh, before we can actually get enough numbers of those cells to give back to the patients. 
So there's promise um, with thinking about, you know, using myoblasts in defined regions, um, a direct injection. Um, however, there's a lot of challenges still, uh, still left to think about with regard to those uh, cell transplant experiments. And so this sort of summarizes uh, where we are in the field with thinking about using stem cells in uh, the context of DMD. And most of these studies have been done in the mouse models, um, MDX, for example. And the um, real differences here, as you can see, are the different sources, right? The different types of cells, right? So they have different molecular markers, right? So they're purified with specific molecular markers. Um, they have different adhesive properties. Uh, they have different dye exclusion properties. So, so you know, it, how we get these cells um, is, is really, you know, different in different stem cell contexts. Um, and then, how many cells do we inject? This is going to change how these cells behave in these different models, right? So how do we inject them? What numbers? These are all things that really have been tested in these different um, preclinical models as well as um, early MDX mouse model studies. Another thing that we do routinely to test stem cell potential is to not only use the uh, MDX model, but to also induce an additional damage um, in those models. So those are things like um, treating the cells with, uh, treating the animals um, at the site of where you're gonna inject the stem cells maybe 24 hours prior with an, an, a toxin inducing agent. And this really kind of helps to open up the niche um, to eventually let your stem cells um, get in and repopulate. So what are the things we look for in these models? Well, obviously in the models um, that we're talking about, we're looking for if dystrophin is restored or not. We're also asking the question of, if it's a real stem cell, can it repopulate that stem cell niche? And so you can see that there are differences in these different sources of cells that some can or cannot um, carry out these different properties. So some have the ability to engraft, may not have the ability to restore dystrophin. Uh, some have the ability to functionally improve the muscle, but they may not um, be able to get in, reside, and act as a satellite cell in vivo. So uh, these could be good or bad, right? So it just, it all depends on uh, really the biology as we're learning it about how these stem cells behave in these different models. So it could be that we think about combinations of stem cells um, or just really using these stem cells as a tool to understand um, how to, to harness stem cell biology for, for DMD. Now, another important parameter in testing stem cells in, in, in many different stem cell systems is, is the ability to, to test these in an environment where they really can engraft, right? And so human cells are gonna get rejected um, into mouse models unless you change the model itself. So there's been a really groundbreaking series of mouse models that have been developed, which are called immunodeficient mice. And these mice are important because these can be used for human xenografts, right? So we can inject our different stem cell populations, um, different human uh, stem cells into these immunodeficient mice and they won't get rejected. So um, there's a history of these different mouse models, uh, starting with nude mice, which lack T cells, and then more mice skid were created um, that were engineered to lack T and B cells, and then the nod skid mice, which lack T, B, and NK cells. And really now the field is, is, is moving towards using these um, nog mice, which are even more severe immune deficient. Um, as well as the NSG mice. And so the more immunodeficient, um, the less chance of rejection and the better that you chance you're gonna have to test your stem cell function in these models. So it's really about creating an environment where your stem cells can engraft. Um, and so it's a lot of you know, time and effort has been spent on thinking about making these models to test different stem cell populations. So a great example of that is using the NSG mice, these immunodeficient mouse models, but crossing these mice to MDX mice. So now you have an immunodeficient model and um, mice lacking dystrophin, right? So you can test your, your human stem cells in the context of the disease without the concern of um, rejection. And so one of the um, interesting studies um, 
that has been done from pluripotent stem cells, another type of stem cells we've talked about, is really thinking about generating a satellite cell equivalent or a skeletal muscle progenitor from pluripotent stem cells and then testing their potential to engraft in this mouse model, the MDX NSG. And so here is actual data from this paper, which I encourage you to read to think more about is, um, you know, what's the potential of these cells to engraft? Um, and so one of the things that we've learned is depending on the different stem cell population, here is pluripotent stem cell derived progenitors, we can get different levels of engraftment. Another important point is that not all pluripotent stem cell lines are the same. So this is showing you H9, which is an embryonic stem cell, IPS1, which is one type of an IPSC, and then IPS2, which is a different induced pluripotent stem cell line. These all may behave a little bit differently in their ability to differentiate. So it's important to test this across multiple pluripotent stem cell lines. And, and so this is really early work suggesting that using pluripotent stem cell derived skeletal muscle cells, these cells can graft. Um, and repopulate the, the satellite cell niche uh, derived from pluripotent stem cells. So there's a lot of exciting preclinical studies in these different models going on. Um, and I think now we're really just trying to understand um, which of, again, which are the best stem cell populations? What are the right models? Should we test them first in mouse, then dog? Once you see a positive result there, do we think about humans? So these are things as stem cell biologists we think about in terms of the testing the properties in the preclinical space of these cells. So this table just summarizes um, how, which of these stem cells have been tested and in which models, right? So um, a lot of these cells have been tested in the, the gold standard MDX model. Um, I didn't tell you about them, but there's a series of unique models where MDX is crossed um, uh, to different mouse models that make these animals more severe, uh, so have a more uh, severe disease progression. So a lot of these different stem cells have been tested in those models. Some, although not quite as many, have been tested in the dog models, the, the, the golden retriever model that I told you about. Uh, myoblasts have been really the, the, the great example of this. And um, a few other stem cell potential um, regenerative populations have been tested. But as you can see, the majority have not been tested yet in human. Um, there are some trials in progress right now with mesenchymal as well as mesangioblast cells that we're sort of still waiting to see. And I've already shown you some of the, the data of the myoblast studies where it's difficult to look at um, differences in strength um, in those different, um, those different clinical studies. So I think that those studies are still ongoing and, and there's a number of different um, avenues to pursue but we're, we're really still testing these different stem cell populations. So, so this is a nice summary, I think, because it shows you kind of the promise of using of stem cells for, for DMD and where we are. So, so with regard to satellite cells, which is interesting because, right, this is the endogenous muscle uh, stem cell, which you know, has the ability to continuously renew and make new muscle. But there's been very little progress because, you know, as soon as you obtain these cells, uh, they immediately differentiate. And so they've lost their stemness potential and they immediately differentiate to become a more myoblast-like cell. So that's why a lot of the trials have been done with myoblast cells. Now these cells have been studied extensively, but as I showed you, they don't have, um, there's not a lot of um, improvement in function. They may not engraft well. If they do engraft, they can't reside in the satellite cell position, right? So they're not the true stem cell. So they don't have the ability to continuously renew and repopulate that muscle environment. And then there's a lot of concern about um, immune rejection and how this is going to affect stem cell biology in general. Mesangioblasts um, are, you know, unique cells that really have um, been shown in some preclinical models to have some potential for DMD but their expansion is, is less well understood. The biology of these cells still need a lot of characterization, and there's just varying engraftment potential depending on the model that's used. Mesenchymal stem cells have been really well studied in a number of different systems, and they've been well studied in the context of muscle and in the context of DMD. But it seems that the mesenchymal cells um, also have um, not really a role in, in getting in and, and harnessing the actual position in the satellite cell would, right, at the, acting as a stem cell, 
but may be important because it could provide other supportive factors, right? So other supportive cues that are telling the endogenous stem cell, hey, you know, maintain your stem cell potential and maybe keeping those stem cells along, uh, alive a little bit longer, right? So these are important studies that I think are still ongoing, but have really, because of their ease of use, isolation been pushed forward in the field. Um, pericytes are another interesting source. Um, we're still thinking about their use. We need more preclinical studies. There's a lot of differences in pericyte subpopulations that we're still trying to understand. So, so I think we're getting there. I just think it's, it's, um, there's more preclinical work that's needed. And the same is true for the human CD133 positive cells. They have, you know, engraftment potential. Can they reside in the satellite cell position? I think these are kind of ongoing questions. I just want to spend the last few slides thinking about um, really where we are in terms of uh, personalized medicine with regard to thinking about combining stem cells with other approaches. And one of my favorite avenues is, is really thinking about combining both a stem cell approach as well as a gene correction approach. So, so why would you need this? Well, I've already told you that pluripotent stem cells um, can be derived from patients that have DND, right? So we can take their fibroblast cells, we can reprogram them, make a human-induced pluripotent stem cell, we can then differentiate them into skeletal muscle or cardiomyocytes or neurons or cell types affected in the disease. However, because they're coming from that patient, um, they have the patient-specific mutation. So in order to move this forward, you need to think about combination therapies. And one potential combination approach is using a gene editing or gene correction strategy. And one of the really, I think, uh, most phenomenal breakthroughs um, in the last few years has been the development of a gene editing platform called CRISPRs, or Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats and Associated Protein Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9, just for short, that's what we call it. Well, this gene editing platform really takes advantage of this protein Cas9, which has the ability, as you can see in the schematic, to induce double-stranded breaks. But it only does this at specific sites in the genome, essentially near um, an NGG sequence, and also where you tell it to go with your guide, which is called a guide RNA, which is going to um, go to the specific sites that you, how you, depending on how you've designed your guide. So, so this CRISPR-Cas9 cutting technology has the ability to really engineer um, changes in the genome. Now, in the case of DMD, one could consider different approaches of gene editing that could render a functional dystrophin protein using this approach. And doing this in the context of a stem cell might allow you to both correct that cell from the patient and, and then give it back to patients to avoid immune rejection in the context of continuous repopulation in, in DMD. So there's been a number of really interesting preclinical studies that have used CRISPRs, and, and let me just walk you through um, one of those, which is shown here. Essentially, uh, performed from the Olson lab, what they did was in the mouse model um, of DMD, the MDX model, which I've told you about, they essentially um, took these, these mice and they engineered the, the CRISPR-Cas9 system in the zygote, right, of these MDX zygotes. And essentially what this did was correct the mutation in this MDX mouse model to restore dystrophin. So um, because they did this in the zygote, they were able to, um, you know, generate mice from these corrected zygotes that had um, affected cell types corrected. But, you know, the efficiency of this CRISPR um, editing is, is variable, right? So sometimes the efficiency was, you know, ranged from 17% from to 83%, right, depending on um, the approach and the efficiency of the targeting. And so what this allowed um, the field to do was to study gene editing in the context of how much dystrophin is needed um, to be restored. Um, and so this just this is primary data from the from this uh, paper showing that essentially, depending on the level of gene editing, um, you get different amounts of dystrophin, or depending on the efficiency of gene editing that occurred in the zygote, you get different levels of dystrophin restoration. And this is really, I think, groundbreaking work that is at the forefront of thinking about 
you know, gene correction, the context um, of DMD. So one of the things I think that is really um, at the next era of personalized medicine is thinking about c combining, right, these different uh, correction approaches with stem cells, right? So, so I think that's another use for stem cells in the context of, of Duchenne. So where are we with regard to stem cell therapy for DMD? You know, we're, we've come a long way. Um, we know so much about the properties of these stem cells. I've spent a lot of time telling you about these different potential stem cell populations, the pericytes, the angioblasts, the satellite cells, the myoblast cells. Now we're really at the next phase of trying to understand, you know, what are each of these unique stem cell populations going to do um, in the context of DMD? Are they going to su provide a supportive role? Are they gonna actually be able to continuously repopulate and give rise to new satellite cells? Uh, which stem cell population would we think about from patients? Well, immune rejection is an issue, right? So, so there's um, you know, a lot of discussion on, on, on how to really tackle the, the immune um, issue as well as um, thinking about combining correction approaches with stem cells also might um, you know, need some consideration of immune um, immune suppression, and so that, that, that's something that the field is, is thinking about with regard to combination approaches. Now, as you well know, um, both the heart and skeletal muscle is affected, um, so there's multiple muscle types affected in DMD. So, so what we've spent the most time thinking about um, in these lectures is really how to um, target the skeletal muscle, but the heart is also another um, organ system that is severely affected in DMD. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done about understanding how is the heart um, changing in the context of DMD and can we, if at all, think about stem cell approaches um, in the heart. And so I think these are really exciting avenues um, of research that are ongoing. And, um, you know, I think we're just really at the point where we have a lot of different stem cell populations and now we have to understand which one to really move forward, or how many do we move forward, in what models, and, and how do we think about that in the context of each patient. So I think that's coming. I think that there are challenges, but I have no doubt that um, we will be seeing you know, stem cell-based approaches for, for DMD in the near future. So with that, I'd like to thank you for um, the opportunity to tell you about different stem cell aspects for DMD, and I hope that I've convinced you um, to become a stem cell biologist as well as think about um, harnessing the potential of stem cells for patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Thanks. Mm -hmm.